Presenting a case is essential for all physicians throughout their careers. Incoming interns will need to master this skill for rounds, sign-off process, and calling consults. In this video, I will provide you with a framework or a template to help you present any case concisely, focus on what matters, and avoid distractions. This is the sixth video of our first week of residency tip series. A link to the full playlist is provided below. Let's start. The following elements are the backbone for any case presentation. Patient's age and gender, relative past medical history, surgical history, family history, social history, not everything, just the relative one, the chief complaint and any diagnosis or presumptive diagnosis made on admission, the treatment that received on admissions, only mention the treatment that was provided for the active acute problem, updates on the presenting symptoms or associated symptoms or signs, Relative physical exam findings, do not forget vital signs. Relative diagnostic data, imaging, labs, EKG, etc. Assessment, and this is a one-liner that follows this format. A, year old lady or gentleman, day so-and-so admission, presented with chief complaint, and admitted with or for, and you put the reason for admission. And we finish by the plan, which is the plan of the active problem and discharge process, which I will discuss this in a minute. Now, relative past medical history, surgical history, family history, social history, is the history that's directly related to the active problem or the presenting problem. Let's have some example here. A 60-year-old lady with chest pain, which one of the following is not a relative history? Coronary artery disease, hypertension, diabetes, hypothyroidism, or gout. As an attending physician, I will be concerned about the cardiac etiology of this chest pain. I need to know about any coronary artery disease risk factors. I don't care if you skip gout and hypothyroidism in this case in your presentation, but it's paramount to mention the history of coronary artery disease, diabetes, and hypertension. Let's take another example. A 33-year-old gentleman presented with hematemesis, which one of the following is not a relative history? Alcohol abuse, chronic headache, diabetes. Here we have a young patient with upper GI bleeds, so alcohol abuse indicates the possibility or likelihood of cirrhosis, portal hypertension, and varices. Chronic headaches may indicate the likelihood of long-term NSAID use. Diabetes may not be relative in this case. How about active problems? Active problems are the one we are either starting a new treatment for, or changing the course of treatment for, or closely monitoring during the hospital stay. Let's take another example. A 70-year-old patient with a history of diabetes and hypothyroidism admitted with C. diff colitis. Labs showed potassium of 2.6, WBC of 16, and blood sugar 120. The rest are unremarkable. All of the following are considered active problems except C. diff colitis, hypokalemia, leukocytosis, diabetes or hypothyroidism. Now, for active, for C. diff colitis, this is the primary active problem. So definitely it's on the top of our active problems. Then hypokalemia, there is low potassium, so we need to replete, replace and monitor. Leukocytosis, there is an active problem that we need to monitor, make sure it gets better. And diabetes, the treatment of diabetes in this patient is likely will be changed and needs close monitoring. So the correct answer here is hypothyroidism. There is no need to change the treatment or closely monitor this issue during this hospital stay. So it doesn't matter to me as an attending physician if you mention hypothyroidism during your case presentation or not. Now let's apply the full framework to a case, but before that, if you want to receive a summary of this video or access previous video summaries, kindly subscribe to my Substack by typing the rahamni.substack.com in your browser or just follow the link below. For the best experience, I highly recommend downloading the Substack app. Let's go back to the example, an 80-year-old lady with past medical history of diabetes, coronary artery disease, essential hypertension, and hypothyroidism presented to the ED a day earlier with lower abdominal pain. She was diagnosed with acute sigmoid diverticulitis, no history of previous diverticulitis attacks. She was started on IV antibiotics. Her initial CBC showed WBC of 16. Let's go over the framework. So patient age and gender, an 80-year-old pleasant lady, relative past medical history, surgical history, family history, or social history. The only relative really history here is that there is no previous acute diverticulitis episodes. 
because that will dictate or affect the future treatment. Then third, the presenting complaints, which is lower abdominal pain, then diagnosis or presumptive diagnosis. This is clear, acute sigmoid diverticulitis. Initial treatment AD was IV piperacillin and tazobactam. Presenting symptoms or associated symptoms and signs update. The pain improved significantly, no associated nausea or vomiting. The patient is tolerating clear liquid diet, no bowel movement. This is an example. Relative physical exam, here the vital signs show the blood pressure was running around 180 systolic over the last three vital checks. Here lift lower quadrant, tenderness is still present but significantly better, no rebound tenderness or distension. Diagnostic data relative to the active problem, the CT abdomen and pelvis on admission showed findings suggestive of acute diverticulitis. WBC today is 12 compared to 16 yesterday and the rest of CBC and CMP are, are remarkable. The assessment, the one-liner, an 80 year old lady, day one admission, presented with lift lower corner abdominal pain and was admitted with acute sigmoid diverticulitis. Let's go over the plan. So we're just gonna talk about the active problem and here the active problems, acute sigmoid diverticulitis and the plan she's let's say clinically better with less pain and tenderness, will continue IV antibiotics for another day, advanced diet as tolerated and transition to oral antibiotics in AM. Second, leukocytosis, we saw the white count was 16. It's resolving or improving, repeat CBC in AM. Then I'm gonna mention the essential hypertension because the blood pressure readings were uncontrolled and I will say it's uncontrolled, we'll readjust her medications to achieve better control. But be more specific here, see what kind of medication she's on, what changes you're gonna make or you're gonna add any medications. And of course, I'm gonna mention diabetes because the treatment is likely will be changed. Probably we're gonna stop any oral diabetes medications. So the plan will be diabetes, for example, adequately controlled with current insulin regimen, but again, be more specific. And I will finish by discharge. And I will say something like that, likely home in AM. You may purchase or download this framework by following the link provided in the description field. Now, some attending physicians may prefer a more detailed, lengthy presentation as if you are reading the full HMP. I suspect these are very few because it's very time consuming and unnecessarily prolongs the official rounds. Anyhow, I highly encourage you to check with your colleagues on your attending physician preferences and adapt to that. Now, with this case presentation, calling a consult is pretty straightforward. The difference is that consultants want to hear what matters to them. A very concise, focused case presentation that's relative to the consultation reason. Use the following as a framework for calling a consult. First, greet, introduce yourself and what's your role. Second, say I'm calling you to see if you can help us with our patient and then you add the reason for consultation. And then concise case presentation. Basically here you just read the assessment and then you finish by making sure they have the patient name and location and you end by thanking them for accepting that consultation. Now let's assume the above patient, the diverticulitis patient had recurrent attacks of sigmoid diverticulitis and we wanted to consult general surgery. I would say something like this. Hi Dr. X, my name is Maher. I'm a medical resident with Dr. So-and-so. I'm calling you to see if you can help us with our patient's recurrent attacks of sigmoid diverticulitis. She's an 80 year old lady who presented yesterday with another attack of sigmoid diverticulitis and we're treating her with IV antibiotics. This is her fourth attack in one year. Her name is X and she's in room 400 for example. Some consultants may have additional questions but the above framework works for most of them who are busy and want you to get to the point right away. Now this case presentation also represents the backbone of the sign off process. The night team will need the following information to speed up their response to your patient's needs and to avoid any undesirable orders. Patient's name and location, of course, and this automatic when you print your list, a brief and focused history, and here just put, just copy and paste your assessment and plan, things to watch for and what to do, and diagnostic data to follow up on and what to do as well. So let's apply this framework to the same patients. Of course, the patient name and location. Again, this will be automatically by default will be on the printed list. Brief focused history. And we just here put the assessment and plan. An 80 year old lady admission day one with acute sigmoid diverticulitis with significant improvement in her pain and lift lower quadrant tenderness. will continue the IV antibiotic for one more day. And advanced diet as tolerated. We are repeating CBC in M and likely will be discharged in M. Sometimes yeah, the assessment one liner may be enough, but I'd like to add this, especially for new interns so they have more information. And then you add things to it. Please refrain from giving IV narcotics if possible and rely on oral narcotics instead. Please use melatonin if she asks for a sleeping aid. 
And in diagnostic uh, data and follow-ups, there is none for these patients. Again, you can download all these frameworks by following the links below. Next video, we'll discuss discharge process. If you find this video useful, kindly give it a like, share it with your colleagues, and subscribe to the channel if you have not done so. And remember that you can get a summary of this video by subscribing to my Substack. Thanks for watching and see you soon.